Hello, and thank you for the very nice welcome. And as promised, um, I'm going to talk about man-made nuclear fusion in this talk. So, and I'd like to start to catch up with a phrase which has already been mentioned. Um, the worldwide appetite for energy is increasing. Yeah, we know that. And if you look at a diagram, for example, this one, you see that the electricity which is needed worldwide for the next few years is increasingly immense. Yeah, you see that there's in the next 30 years, it doubles. So we need to come up with ideas to provide this energy. It has to come from somewhere. And we've de already developed a lot of technologies, um, like for example, we use fossils, like coal, oil, or gas. We also have technology to use rene uh, renewable energy, like wind power, solar power, water power. But there's a caveat to that. Um, fossils are not going to be around forever. If you continue using them like we do right now, they're going to be empty soon, pretty soon. Another problem with renewable energy sources is that it's like not a good, uh, not a good efficiency. So you need to cover a lot of space to get the same energy. So if you continue doing that, we put a severe threat to the nature and with that also to us. So let me ask this question. Can we come up with an additional energy source which can generate maximum output but with only little input? To tackle this question, I want to jump right into physics um, and start with the concept of nuclear power. You know nuclear power, a normal, like common nuclear power plant, plant you split heavy nuclei, like uranium. You get energy out of that. But there's another way. You can also fuse light atoms, and you will get energy out of that as well. The principle which is behind that, it's the so-called energy mass conversion, or which you probably better known under the formula, the famous equation, E, uh, e equals mc squared. And now, in this talk, I concentrate on fusion. So, if you want to do this on Earth, you need ingredients. You need to find atoms which you want to fuse. Let's take deuterium and tritium. Deuterium and tritium are water hydrogen isotopes, heavy and super heavy. We fuse them together, something happens, and we get out a helium atom, and a neutron. Since we talked about the fuels before, we also want to talk about this as, uh, here as well. So where do we get the fuel from? The deuterium. The deuterium is a part of our seawater reservoir, the oceans. It doesn't seem a lot, but we don't need a lot. If we, need, if we take out what we need for a fusion power plant, for example, the amount of deuterium will last for millions of years. Similar is true for the tritium. Tritium is a radioactive isotope, so we have to generate it. It will last for 12 years, then half is gone, and so on and so on. But we can generate it from lithium, and lithium is a well-known thing. You know it in every well, battery of your cell phone, every car battery uh, these days, you have lithium. So if you, if you generate it, you put it together, you have to get to this neutron. The neutron is the player here. It carries the energy. It's over 14 mega electron volt. So how much is that? How can we get a handle on that? If you imagine you have one gram of deuterium tritium, like you would usually have in a power plant, even less, the energy equivalent you would get out of that is 10 million grams of coal. So that is a lot less. In other words, if you, for example, fill a bathtub of water, like for the deuterium reservoir, and you take a car accumulator, the battery for the lithium, take the tritium out, fuse it, you get the energy of 500,000 kilowatt hours. That is enough for 1,000 people for a year. So there's a lot of potential. Now we know why we should do something. We know what to do, but now we have to think about how we do it. So as a scientist, you would look around yourself in nature. How does nature do it? Is there a way that we can copy it? Well, there is something which is close by, which is actually a huge nuclear power plant. It's our star. It's a common star. It's the sun in our solar system. 
That is a huge power plant. It has been operated, running for billions of years, and will so in the future. So that is something we can use. The question is, can we bring it to the Earth? Like the sun? No, no chance. So we have to come up with something else. And if we look at the picture in the back, that are the picture of a polar light structure. And you see, it's simply a glowing light. It's a plasma, like in the sun, but it's following a structure, and that is the magnetic field of the Earth. So if you have a magnetic field, you can use it if you form it in a smart way to confine a plasma that will be very hot on Earth, 100 million degrees Celsius in a way that it won't touch any wall. So that's what we need. And this was actually enough to inspire people from the early 50s on to build machines for this plasma confinement, magnetic confinement machines. One example of the early days is the so-called perhepsatron. Perhaps it might work. Um, you see this little purple ring there. That's the beginning of everything. So they thought something like this would work, and now 70 years later, we are about to prove them right. So just side mark. Um, and it developed further on. We have other very important, very famous experiments. We have university-sized experiments. There are tons of, thousands of those experiments has been around and are still operated these days. I cannot count them all. But what I want to show you here, of course, is the top notch, the high end of it. So this is a project which is being realized at this moment in France, in Kadarash. It's called ITER. It's a huge fusion device based on magnetic confinement. This picture here, uh, you see the blue magnets uh, surrounding this purple column of plasma. This generates the magnetic fields you need. And this is a, well, a sketch of the machine, how it will look like. And I circled this little person right there to, to get you a feeling how big this is. You need big machines to get enough energy out of that, right? If we continue now, uh, this is a picture of the, of, the, of the site where the eater has been built. So you see into the hall, there's a, which is hanging from the wall and will be, uh, will be installed pretty soon. The mission goal of this, this machine is that you would gain 10 times more energy out of the plasma compared to what put in. So that's the mission goal of it. And as you see this little, little fleck around there, it's actually an international project. Many players are in the game. It's a project which is well, worldwide of interest. Another confinement uh, experiment is the so-called Wendelstein 7X. It's also based on huge magnets, which are circular. It has a slightly different structure, though. It's, it looks much more complicated, 3D shaped. Like you, would, you wouldn't come just by thinking about it loosely. So you need a lot of thought put in this magnetic field configuration. Uh, and this is operated in Germany. And as I'm standing here coming from there, um, I'd like to use this experiment to show you what ingredients, what parts are necessary to actually build and run this thing. So take you on a journey here to Greifswald. It's a small city at the Baltic Sea. Um, where the, our institute is sit here uh, and where this machine, machine Wendelstein 7X is operated. Wendelstein 7X is not made for generating fusion, um, but it's made to show that magnetic confinement is working. If you would build a power plant based on this principle, it could work. So now let's go into the torus hall. There you see the big machine. And what we do now is, we open up everything, go inside, and put it back together so you understand what's necessary. So first of all, you're going to need magnets. These are six-ton magnets, huge, expensive, heavy, and we need 50 of those to generate the magnetic field, which will then confine the plasma. It cannot be calculated by pen and pencil. Supercomputers has to calculate perfect shape, the optimized shape, um, so, that, so that plasma is confined and not touching the wall at any point. Yeah. So if you now put the vacuum vessel, let us go into the vacuum vessel. You see this pop ring. This is actually the, the glowing plasma here. 
But if we, if we want to go inside the, the vacuum vessel again, you see that on the inner walls, you have the heat shield construction. This heat shield is to take 10 million watts per square meter. That is more than a space shuttle would, would need uh, when it re-enters the at atmosphere. So we have to be covered pretty well. Uh, the whole machine itself, as I already like mentioned, is pretty heavy. We're talking about 50 tons of pure metal, cables, everything. Um, and there's a specialty to that. Because we are using for confinement, 10,000 amps are induced each of those magnets. So they have to be out of a material which is not getting hot when so much amps is running through them. And this is called a superconducting material. A superconducting material uh, has to be cooled down to minus 270 degrees Celsius, almost zero, zero, no, nothing more. Yeah? And then it operates. Yeah? You see there's a lot of spaces, a lot of openings, a lot of holes in the machine. This is for our scientists, for our, well, it's like I am, uh, to do science. Um, but now, Let's actually generate a plasma. So if you follow me here, you find those little nozzles everywhere in the machine. And we puff a small amount of plasma into the vessel, just a few milligram. And then we're going to use microwaves up to six, seven millions of watts to actually heat up the gas, generate the plasma, which then will increase of Celsius. So imagine when we're running this machine, which is actually happening. And about 50 centimeters away, we have the minus 270 degrees cooled down magnets. Makes this hottest, coolest place in the solar system at once, which is pretty cool, I think. Now, this is an actual experiment. Uh, it's, it's a snapshot of one of our experiments. Uh, you see a movie of the plasma. This is how it looks like. It has some structure, it moves around, does some wiggling. Um, and there are some typical parameters like the power, density, temperatures. We have here 5 million watts of heating power, a few milligram of hydrogen, 30 million degrees Celsius, the electrons, uh, a pretty high plasma energy of 600,000 joule. And the temperature of the heat shield and you notice this is just 100 degrees, 200 degrees Celsius. That is not so much. So the confinement is working pretty well. The uh, goal, or let's say the mission of this uh, machine, is um, to show that we can run this experiment not for 30 seconds, but for 30 minutes. So everything has to be stable in this time. Yeah, you see there's a, uh, a snapshot of the control room, and there was some we had some visitors uh, when we started. So let me make a final case for fusion at this point. So first of all, it's clean. Yeah? We don't have any CO2, any carbon emission, because we're not generating it. We're generating helium by the uh, fusion of deuterium tritium. It's abundant, so we have a lot of energy, uh, a lot of fuel, and it's everywhere. Everybody has access to it. There's no, like, only a certain amount of countries has access to these fuels. It's really everywhere. It is safe, inherently, so there is no catastrophic failure possible. The moment you disturb the balance for this burning plasma, it touches something and cools off, and that's it. It just turns itself off. Huh? Um, and it's economic, since the fuels are very, let's say, cheap and easy to get, it's also an economic uh, system. But of course, there's work to do. We are not there yet. Yeah. So we need to develop materials uh, which can uh, withstand the heat better, which are better conducting. Superconducting materials have to be developed a little bit. And nowadays, such a coil is pretty expensive, a few million uh, euros just for one coil. And it's pretty difficult to build. We need maintenance technology, robots go into a power plant, take out uh, parts which has been you know, used or changed, you need to change. Um, the very important question, of course, is the timeline. Whenever you ask a fusion scientist 
when do we have the power plant? They're going to answer in 30 years. And I'm doing the same now. But the, the difference is, I think, we have never been that close to actually build a working reactor. So it might actually be holding this time, the 30 years, maybe less. We have many new private players in the game, meaning over the last few months, startups are coming out from everywhere working on this field, private companies. So, and if you now look at the timeline, these are just a few experiments um, which has been realized over the years, years, years. You see that as this, this arrow towards the fusion power plant, we are pretty close and ITER probably is the last, well, final step for the next demo reactor we are going to build. So, finally, yes, can we come up with an additional energy source? which has maximum output but minimum input, I think yes. But we, are need, we need everybody who is able to work on that. Resources, man manpower, ideas, everything. But then we can actually develop reliable primary energy source, which will then, with all the others, give us well, the opportunity to maybe solve the energy problem for the nearest future. Thank you for your attention.